we've heard uh, a talk yesterday by Susan about how to find some representations of knot groups. In particular, uh, she talked about parabolic representations, SL2C representations. And uh, also talked about some finite image representations, especially uh, Mendelian. So let's now talk about twisted uh, Alexander polynomials and get to what they are. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of ways to do this. Some of them will overwhelm you with algebraic topology. Um, I really want to show you what I think is the absolutely simplest way of computing these things. And then we'll see some other, other versions of it. And, um, and we eventually see some, you know, we'll see the algebraic topology, of course, but, but let me show you the simplest way to get your hands dirty for the marker and, and do these things. So, by way of uh, recall, let's remember how we computed, very quickly, how we computed the, uh, the standard classical Alexander polynomial. We took a diagram for the, for the knot, and uh, we labeled the arcs by xi. So we have xi, xj, and xk, leaving um, <coughs> one arc unlabeled or ignored, the x0 arc we will ignore for computation. And to each crossing, we associate a relation, which is xi plus t xj equals xk plus t xi. And we put together a large matrix we might call the Alexander matrix M and um, <coughs> if there are uh, arcs x0, x1, and xn, we're only going to be focusing on these. So we're going to have an n by n matrix. You can think of the columns as, oops, as labeled x1, x2, and so on. But let's focus on xi, xj, and xk somewhere here. And so in the uh, xi position, we just record. We have one contribution here. We have t contributions here on this side. So it's 1 minus t. I guess, I guess this is the, I gotta stop doing that. This isn't chalk. This is the uh, ith relation, so it might be somewhere here. One minus t for that. Uh, we have a t contribution to the xj. We have a minus one contribution to the xk. We do this for each of the relations. We ignore our favorite or least favorite relation. So uh, ignore, cross out uh, any one relation. And uh, that is any one crossing, and put this matrix together. And then the determinant of M is the Alexander polynomial. Okay. So let's contrast this with the following idea. Uh, let's assume that gamma of pi to, let's make this very general, have a GLN R. Linear representation of our knot group. Um, we'll assume here that R is the Ethereum and UFD, nothing more. Uh, let's do the from now on gamma of Xi uh, by um, capital Xi. And here I need to say something that I don't know if we've actually made explicit, and probably everybody knows it, but, um, but it's a good time to say it. Uh, the, the diagram, these arcs here, represent generators of the knot group. And there is a so-called Verdinger presentation. Of pi, our knot group, which is given by the generators and then the crossing relations. And the crossing relation here would be, I think Susan certainly did this, xi uh, xj equals xk xi. And you can ignore any one relation. 
So that's what I mean by um, the image of Xi. Xi is now being regarded as a generator of the knot group. Instead of writing gamma of Xi, uh, you're going to write capital Xi. And um, I apologize for using gamma instead of rho, which is probably more common in the, in the literature, just because when you're, when you're, when you're working, as Susan and I have been trying to do with, with both dynamics and topology, you run out of letters. And certain letters have already been claimed. And the rho is claimed. So after a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, agonizing <coughs> deliberation, uh, we settled on gamma. It seems uh, the most innocuous. So here's the, uh, <coughs> here's the idea that the uh, relation now <coughs> gets, a, gets a little twist. And the relation now looks like this. Xi plus T capital Xi uh, Xk equals Xk, little xk, plus T capital Xk uh, Xi. If you're having trouble reading these, put a little serifs. Okay, so don't worry about what this where this lives for the moment. Let's just let's remember that over here the xi's were just formal formal plate for, formal placeholders. They're really generators of a module, and here they're they're also generators of a module. But I'm still going to think about them right now, not as module generators, but as placeholders for matrix. So now we we put together a matrix, which we'll call M gamma for twisted Alexander matrix. And once again, we're going to have xi, xj, and xk keeping our place. But now into here we put block matrices instead of instead of uh, uh, polynomials. Yes. There, there's no xj. There's no j subscript in the relation that you wrote down. Interesting. The first. Yeah. <laughs> it should look absolutely the same as here. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but notice one thing one thing to notice uh, is that this this of course this xi here is 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 being kind of carried by by this and this matches this and it's sort of the effect of it's sort of the effect of, of uh, something being dragged along some some uh, uh, some path corresponding to xi and and when it arrives sort of at the beginning of a path xj it's it's, it's been twisted. And that's really the intuition here. And, and up in the universal cover, we can actually see this happen. This is, this is, and those are familiar Fox calculus, we we'll smell all kinds, of, all kinds of Fox calculus. Okay. So now we, we put together the matrix, and, and instead of um, 1 minus t, it's, it's i minus t times um, um, xi. Uh, yes, you're right, xk. Thank you. And uh, this should be TXI, and this should be minus I. So this is the twisted Alexander matrix. And here comes the, um, I, I, I find this, this sentence to be particularly irksome. Uh, it's, it's a block matrix, but now remove the inner parentheses. Um, one actually would like to make that really precise in a better way, but, but this is kind of strange. So, uh, regard uh, M gamma as N. Well, it's not N by N anymore because these are capital N by N blocks. Just say flat. 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 Array flat. Yes. It's easy. It's easy. <laughs> flat, but not the whole way. Okay. Oh, by the way, that, this, this command. Is, is relatively new to Mathematica. It's, it's worth it. <laughs> it's, uh, for doing these calculations, it makes life really easier. OK, so this essentially removes the inner parentheses. And, uh, and so now we get uh, capital, little n by capital n by little n by capital n matrix over, um, over R T T inverse, <coughs> which we've been sometimes calling uh, capital lambda. And so now uh, we arrive at the. Uh, well, let me let me put it up here. Uh, so so, just first of all, no, notice how similar this is. This is uh, I mean, almost almost nothing has changed symbolically. Right? 
And the uh, definition um, let's call this the water invariant. I'll try to explain what the uh, how these names became associated with what's happened to the what's happened to the phrase twisted out in the polynomial, which seems to be hiding. Uh, the determinant of n gamma divided by the characteristic polynomial of x zero. Now, this is the matrix of the arc that we've that we've uh, ignored in the matrix. In, in, in the matrix again. And uh, this is defined up to units in um, RTT inverse. But in fact, um, in fact, the sign um, is always um, the sign is unique. Is the sign is is uh, is determined if capital N is even. And um, I say something about that later when we talk about Wada's approach. Um, you can do more. You can you can actually um, refine this. Yes. So if you switch the labeling of your little x i's and capital N is even, then that corresponds to switching enough rows to an even number. An even number. Exactly right. Yeah, it's an even number okay. permutations. That's right. Yeah. That's the reason. Okay. So um, more can be done with with making this thing uh, 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 less dependent on on units, but uh, but let me not say anything about that right now. Okay. So first of all, it's a rational expression. A priori. And uh, I plan to say some things about uh, Reidmeister torsion. You know that uh, Reidmeister torsion associated to an auto is also a rational expression. And this is, in fact, a twisted Reidmeister torsion. And, and those of you who are familiar with it will recognize um, you know, sort, of a, sort of a dimension one contribution and dimension zero contribution to the torsion. And that's exactly what this turns out to be. Um, so uh, that's the first thing, it was introduced by Wada. In uh, 1994, in a paper called "Twisted Out's Inner Polynomials of or Twisted Out's Inner Invariants of Finitely Presented Groups," uh, and like the Alexander polynomial, like the classical Alexander polynomial, this is really an invariant of the group, and uh, we're definitely going to talk about that because once you once you have that, then you can you can simplify the calculations enormously. I mean, you could have a, a knot with a, a hundred crossings. You don't want to work with a matrix that large. But if, if the knot group might only have two generators, uh, your, your life becomes easier, assuming you could work with a relation that's 2,000. And it's sloppy or something like that. You pay a price, but you, you get a smaller matrix. Okay. Um, so, uh, I have a question. Yeah. Maybe you said this already. Is x not is that the index that you've Unlikely. that you've already taken out of the matrix? Yeah, yeah. So x x zero for, for in, in, in these talks will always be the, the kind of designated arc of the diagram uh, that uh, will correspond to a column that we've not recorded. It's not here. It's been deleted. Okay. Yes. Um, So, <clears throat> if you go back to Lynn's paper and look at the way Lynn did this in some very special cases, um, you find out that his invariant is actually that. Um, and so, I'm going to explain why, why both the quotient and the numerator are invariants. But uh, Susan and I had been calling this thing, because it came up in some dynamical situation, a coloring polynomial. Um, it should probably be called the Lin polynomial because it, it really is an invariant. And, and, and I'll also tell you what, what the homological meaning of the thing is. It has, a, it has an interesting um, twist of homological interpretation. 
Uh, but this, is, this quotient is one of the two things that's sort of competing in the literature for the name Twisted Alexander Polynomial. It, the other one is, is, um, is, a, is the same thing, except this might be, uh, uh, the denominator might be a factor of this, rather than the whole thing. And sometimes figuring out exactly what factor of this you need to divide by to get the other thing that's called a twisted Alexander polynomial can be very difficult. Bottom line is that this is easier to compute. And uh, the numerator contains all the information that you really need anyway in most of the situations. And that's an important fact. The numerator is containing all the, the stuff in first homology that you want, plus a little extra junk sometimes. It may contain some kind of cyclotomic nonsense and things that you don't want that the <coughs> twisted Alexander polynomial, uh, which is defined homologically, uh, often removes. So um, that's, that's the situation. Notice that the denominator here, all the, all the uh, meridians of a knot group are conjugate. Right? Just look at the vertical relations. All the meridians are conjugate. So if I used a different xi down here, I would have the same polynomial. It's just merely characteristic of polynomial of conjugate matrices. So if you want to know about the uh, well-definedness of this expression, just worry about the well-definedness of the numerator. So, so, uh, um, since this is this true, therefore, uh, well defined in this, defined in this of W depends on that. And we'd like to give this numerator a symbol. Uh, let's call it a capital D gamma, reserving delta D for the uh, other thing that's called the twisted oxygen polynomial. And, and let's call it the let's call it the polynomial. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so how to see that that numerator is, is well defined? Um, Here's a great exercise. Um, this can actually be done very, in a very straightforward manner uh, with writing vector groups. So, exercise. Show that uh, D is invariant under writing vector groups, but I have to explain what the catch is. The catch is that when you do the change the right of view, if you, you you have to also carry with it the representation. It's not hard to see what you need to do. Um, if if for example to take this move, suppose this is x i and x j. It's it's quite it's quite uh, easy to see what you have to do to get the corresponding representation. That is the corresponding matrix labeling of this diagram, which corresponds to a representation of the knot group with a different presentation. So what happens here is you, you still have xi. This is xj. When you follow this thing through, when you look at the vertigo presentation, when you look at the, uh, the, excuse me, when you look at the relations here, the crossings, you see that this coming out here is also xj. That's a consequence of these two crossing relations. And you get a new relation, you get a new, uh, a new uh, uh, generator here, which I always make like backward. Um, Let's just figure out what it is. This is xi, xj equals whatever that is, xi. So that thing is xi, xj, xi inverse. See? Well, that means if this is capital xi and this is capital xj, then this arc should get labeled capital xi, capital xj, capital xi inverse. That's the matrix that, that, that goes there. So notice that, that every matrix labeling one diagram corresponds to a uniquely to a matrix labeling of a diagram you get by Rademeister group. And the other two Rademeister groups are, are similar to the number three being the open. And then you just then you just check that 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 the determinant of the matrix you're getting above is going to be the same. It's, it's straightforward. Okay, so let's let's get to some examples. And I've got a, a number of examples that will maybe give a little bit of intuition about what's going on. So everybody has to start with the 
constructing. So so x zero up on top, x one. This down here will be x two. Um, and um, I already wrote down the, uh, the, the the matrix for this. Let me let me skip a couple steps. Um, the, the simplest representation that we can consider would just map us to uh, the complex numbers regarded as one by one matrices. So let's, let's uh, this is this is worth doing. So let's let's consider GL GL one C, which is just the, the non zero com complex numbers. And uh, you got your choice here. You can send all the XIs. You have to send them all to the same place. Um, let's send them all to some non-zero complex number. Thought it was a one by one matrix. Right? And so now if you, the you reason go, you have to send them all to the same place is because they're conjugate. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an immediately representation. Right. Yes. To yeah. the same omega. Sorry? To the same omega also. Omega yeah. R. No, omega. Om Omega, uh, this is for all, for all this is I. Yeah, for, for all R's. That's what I was saying, because the, the meridians have to be conjugate and they have community of multiplication, so. Yeah, yeah, they're all, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, well, if you do that, then the, um, the matrix M gamma, it's easy, it's easy to check this. It's just uh, T omega minus one, oh, minus one, one minus T. Omega, and the uh, determinant of this, which we're calling the D, uh, is is looks just like the the L, the untwisted Alexander polynomial, but it has this. Uh, it's the it's the untwisted Alexander polynomial evaluated with T replaced by by omega T. Um, and so the Watt invariant is this thing divided by the characteristic polynomial of this matrix is, is uh, of 1 minus omega t. Omega t minus 1 up to units, it doesn't matter. A couple things to notice. Uh, generally, this won't divide. I see, so you see that the wide invariant can, in fact, be, a, be a, a rational expression and not a polynomial. Um, there are some sufficient conditions that are very nice that will tell you that, that this will, in fact, divide you. Um, let me just say it in words. Uh, you look at the commutator subgroup of pi. You look at your representation. You look at the matrices you get from the commutator subgroup. If there's one, at least one element of the commutator subgroup that goes to a matrix that doesn't have one for an eigenvalue, you're in business. <laughs> then this thing will divide here. Um, so uh, that, ha that ha happens fairly often, but it doesn't happen in this situation because the because the commutator subgroup is going trivial. All the, all the elements of the commutator subgroup are going to the identity. Plenty of eigen eigenvectors of eigenvalue. Uh, the other thing to notice is that is that this expression and also this expression, neither one is reciprocal. <laughs> General, unless W is one. So it's, so it's uh, not not a polynomial. Generally, and and not reciprocal. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, should. So uh, yeah, symmetric, uh, palindromic. So uh, if I take if I take t and replace it by t inverse, I want to see the same expression uh, up to a unit. And if you have rational expressions, you can you can still make sense out of that. That's the definition of the scale in this case. Okay. It's not very simple. Um, there are a lot of exam there are a lot of things known about when when uh, when these twisted Alexander polynomials are reciprocal. Um, for example, they're reciprocal when you have unitary representations. Um, and that was in fact shown by um, by Kirk and Livingston. Uh, using using a uh, uh, Poincaré duality. Uh, here's an example that shows that that you don't have to have 
reciprocality. But notice this is kind of a cheat, because if you demand that this be an SL, then suddenly the thing becomes reciprocal. And a much more subtle question is, um, are these invariants generally reciprocal in special linear groups? And that's something that Susan Williams and John Helen and I recently were able to answer negatively. So surprisingly, that doesn't happen. So there are examples, like plenty of times it is, but there are examples where it isn't. Yeah, yeah. And, and the general situation there is still, is still quite murky. So um, there's another, another interesting place. I think we, we, po we posted something on archive uh, just about a month ago that, that had a similar example. Uh, it was kind of motivated by, it was motivated by, by um, uh, <coughs> not examples and some things that happen with, with the algebra written lines. But then we managed to get rid of all the <laughs> knots and figure out what was happening in the algebra. <laughs> so all the motivation disappeared. Um, okay, so uh, that's, a, that's this example. Let, let's, let's look at a, a more interesting one here. Are there any questions? I'll, I'll, really, what I want to do now is show you some examples that will hopefully spark your interest. So here's, a, here's another, another uh, situation, the same example. Trep oil as to the right. I almost said as above. Um, let's, uh, let's send x, x0, capital X0, and then we'll do little x0 goes to 1101, and little x1 will go to 10 uh, minus 1. Well, this is a parabolic representation, trace 2. SL2C. And they come about, this is a two bridge knot, and they come about from uh, uh, the same ideas that Susan was talking about, all of Bob Riley. The Riley polynomial oh, just yeah. happens to be W plus right. 1, so it's good as well. You don't have much choice here, right? The Riley polynomial is, is, is W plus 1. So it's the only choice for non abelian parabolic representation. By the way, we've been using this term non abelian. Non abelian just means that, that the image is abelian. And so, um, in, in this example, uh, x2 is, is determined, it's x0, x1, x2 inverse, x1, x0 inverse, just from reading it off over there, relation. And this matrix, if you want to know, is, is 0, 1, minus 1, 2, but we don't really need that in calculation because the, because the twisted matrix uh, actually doesn't have it. It just has x0 and x1. So if you just break that up, this is all you've got. Notice that this is, this is your x0, and that's your x1. This is the calculation we did before. Um, so in this case, uh, the determinant is t minus 1 squared t squared plus 1. And the characteristic polynomial of one mind of, of uh, x zero is uh, p minus one squared. As you see, so the watt invariant in this case is t squared plus one, which is cyclotomic. And it turns out that um, <coughs> it turns out that that. Um, Torus knots generally uh, give you uh, uh, polynomials with roots on the unit circle, uh, which is, which is uh, if something that's true for the, un for the untwisted case. It remains true in the twisted case for um, um, all I think all representations. I think we, I think we need any addition. All right, so let's, let's ramp it up a bit. Um, <coughs> Susan mentioned last time that you can go from uh, box colorings to um, representations, metabelian representations. Here's a, here's a nice way to think about doing that. It might be fun to play with some more examples like this. Um, the box coloring condition is, is that uh, that a crossing, whatever, whatever you label this, Whatever you label with a Z mod P, that twice the overcrossing is the uh, sum of the undercrossing in the colors. And if you can do that uh, non monochromatically, then you have a non trivial flux color. And because this is an additive condition, 
you can always assume that one of the arcs, say the x0 arc, gets labeled with 0. And so you can pick your, your favorite arc for x0. Let's call this x0. And uh, x1 is here, x2, x3. And uh, <coughs> if you give this color 0, you can always, uh, since uh, this is a field, you can also multiply through. And you can assume that a non-zero label is 1. So let's say that this is 1, assuming that this was going to be non-zero. What's our p? Uh, thank you. We can actually figure that out, but it's going to be 5. So p is 5. <laughs> Yeah, it's the determinant of the knot. The Alexander Plum and the dominator of the plum is one. This is fine. Thank you. Probably kappa from one thing. What's that? Kappa from black. Oh yeah. Um so maybe you have to work by the share. Um so let's see, this is a three, and this is a four. And I think that'll work. So here's a <coughs> here's a box five coloring. And the five colorings give a, uh, a rep to uh, the dihedra group, D5. And the rep is easy. Uh, you take x0 to, um, um, I'm going to think of D5 as, as tau alpha. Uh, tau squared equals alpha to the fifth is one, and equal to uh, um, alpha t to the five, right? I think that'll do it. Or better, better, better yet, let's write it, let's write it this way. Um, alpha tau is tau alpha. And that's, how, that's how the thing goes past. Yeah. And so what you do is you, you, you uh, send this to alpha to its color times tau. And the color is zero. So that's tau. And uh, x1 likewise goes to alpha to its color, which is one tau. This is alpha tau. And x2 goes to alpha to the 4 tau, x3 goes to alpha cube. Now, this is very old stuff. But um, <coughs> d5 has a faithful that is 1 to 1 rep um, in GL5z. And so let's send tau to the matrix T. Which uh, you can think of this as just the action on the on the on the five vertices of a regular uh, pentagon, and how they get permuted. And we're you know the flip, for example, we can take the flip. Uh, 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 well, we got we got two, three, four, five. This is the action of the flip. And so one is fixed, but. 5 and 2 and 4 and 3 are, are flipped. And so we'll, 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 uh, we'll just go to a permutation matrix that does that. And alpha, uh, which is A, goes to uh, rotation. And uh, let me just do that. Um, so in general, when we have some uh, representation to a finite group, we always embed that finite group into some matrix group. Um, every time you, you read you read about somebody using a finite representation in the literature for twisted invariance, that's what they're doing. Sometimes they don't say explicitly. Um, yeah. Okay. And now th this representation has the advantage of being simple. It has the disadvantage of being quite reducible. And I want to show you what happens when the representation has an invariant subspace, especially um, one with. Yeah, and in fact, we should get an irreducible two by two, two, by two representation by the way that I did last time. So be interesting. We should do that and compare. That's a nice exercise. Right. So use use the version. The two by two. That, um, that I talked about. Zero last one one time zero, and, and then the complex two. number. Uh, uh, in this case, um, so w, basically, w, w squared W cubed, where W is a primitive that we're going to learn. Okay. So uh, anyway, so we consider the rep gamma 
GL5 Z, which X0 will be T, X1 will be AT, X2 will be A to the 4 T, X3 will be A to Q T. And uh, the twisted matrix looks like this. I'm writing this down in case you want to try it yourself and compare notes. But um, you can just ignore this. This is x1, x2, x3. x0 is ignored. And now the determinant in gamma turns out to be t squared minus 3t plus 1, t plus 1 to 4, t minus 1 to the fifth. Here's the untwisted Alexander polynomial showing up. And it's showing up because there is a, a one-dimensional invariant subspace with eigenvalue 1. That subspace is spanned by the vector 1, 1, 1, 1, 5. It's just the, the weight vector. And uh, every time you do a permutation representation of this type, if a finite group, if you're going to do it this way, you're going to see the class of Alexander polynomial showing up as a path. So that's a, and so let's see, the, the Watt invariant, by the way, gets rid of a little bit. The characteristic polynomial of x0 is t, t plus 1 squared, t minus 1 cubed, that's a 5. And so the Watt invariant is t squared minus 3t plus 1, t plus 1 squared, t minus 1 squared. If we split off an invariant subspace, we can split that factor off. That is, we can find a basis for C5 beginning with the eigenvector 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then extend it into to, to something orthogonal. And so there's another representation which you could write down, which is four dimensional. Subgroup is a commutator subgroup. Uh, the, the only thing you could, 
if you want to map this to a, to a finite group, you better find a perfect group. And the smallest such is A5. So here we're, we're mapping into A5, in fact, onto A5. And these are cycles of A5. And um, when you follow this thing through, this is, by the way, in the tables, this is 11 n 3 4 You can actually find this thing. I'm not out of this that way. Uh, here's the, uh, the watt invariant. It's got a lot of interesting th factors in it. Uh, it's degree 13. It is, uh, it is reciprocal polynomial. That would be predicted because a finite representation is going to be, uh, a permutation representation is going to be unitary. And the unitary representations uh, are always going to give you reciprocal polynomials. Um, that's a great check, but these are good checks, by the way, when you're doing the computation and you, you, know, you can easily make a mistake. In this example, you, you, uh, you expect to see that. You also expect to see uh, that the denominator dividing um, can check check that, that should have happened. Well, so, what's the, the matrix representation of A5? Well, here they're, they're just using uh, permutation representations in, in, into uh, uh, GL5C. Using, using this. Yeah, I, I, I did check it. They didn't give a lot of details, but it was pretty obvious that what you do. Right. Anyway, here's the example. Now, there's another knot, that, there's another knot that's always paired with this that comes about by cutting a piece out and swapping it over to mute. And, uh, and this is called the Kenoshita Terasaka knot. And uh, <coughs> by the way, both of these knots uh, together adorn the gates at the, the math department at Cambridge. We have a so the Newton Institute, the Newton Institute in, in Cambridge, and it's really pretty. Um, uh, we have a picture of that and we put it on the web page or something. I, I have it in my email, but I didn't. I think it's on the now. Huh? Yes, I know, but it's neat to see it done in, in, in our work. Uh, well, no, 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 the photo, no, no, you're right, the photo, oh, I think the photo is on Oh, the photo is on us always here in this So here's, a, here's, a, here's, another, here's another one. Uh, so this is the KT knot, and, and here's the, um, and here's the um, computation. And, uh, and this, is a, this is degree 11. So you see right away that there's a difference. But the natural question is, uh, what does this tell us? Can we, can we actually conclude that these two knots are different just because these two polynomials are different? Remember that this, is, this polynomial is an invariant that depends on the representation. So what's the punchline? Well, first of all, it's easy to see that if two representations are conjugate, gamma 1 and gamma 2 from pi into gl and r are conjugate. Susan mentioned what this means. That means that there's a matrix in here such a, that one matrix is merely, one, one representation is merely the other uh, followed by conjugation by that fixed matrix. So gamma 2 of, of x is a, gamma 1 of x, a inverse, uh, this is A, such that this is true for all It's very easy to see then that the wadded invariants are equal up to a unit. Because just look at the entries in that matrix. I mean, they all get conjugated. You can just, and the identity showing up in there and the other matrices, no problem. So just, just consider what happens when you, when you conjugate all the entries in the, in the matrix in there. So this is true. So <clears throat> if we look at all representations into a fixed group, let's say onto a fixed group in GL and R, we look at all such gamma. Hopefully this is a, a manageable thing, like a finite group, uh, like A5, or something that we can parameterize reasonably well then the y invariants are functions on the conjugacy classes. And if we can write down all the conjugacy classes of representations, and then write down the associated twisted invariants, we have a basket of polynomials. We do it for the other knot. If the baskets are different, then the knots could not have been uh, isotopic. Why? Because an isotopy is obtained by 
by um, uh, Reidenmeister moves. And the Reidenmeister move carries one representation to another representation. All the representations coincide, and therefore we should have the same basket of variance. Being a little fast, but I think that, that it's easy to fill in those details. Well, what, what uh, Livingston, Kilman, and, and Nike discovered by computation is that for these two knots, there's just one conjugacy class of representations in A5. And since there's only one conjugacy class of representations in A5, your basket has one invariant in every case. And if those invariants are different, then the knots are different. Um, I don't know if there's, a, if there's a nice theoretical way to understand why there's only one conjugacy class. I, I, I don't understand the, 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 the group well enough to know that. If somebody knows, I think it'd be very interesting to, to, to have a, a fact that wouldn't rely on a mathematical calculation. Right. So, um, um, <coughs> there's a uh, <coughs> multivariable version of the of the untwisted polynomial that I, I mentioned. And it's really pleasant to see how the multivariable WADA polynomial comes about without any special effort. So here's a here's another example. This is um <coughs> this is the whitehead link. Pardon me? Um, is it true? I mean, it seems that this invariant doesn't fail as long as the other group doesn't fail. Right. Yeah. It depends on having representation. Oh, oh, I know what you're asking. Ooh. You're asking the million dollar question as far as I'm concerned. This is, is, can you, can you, can you, uh, if you have a faithful representation, will the invariant ever be trivial? The answer is not no. Uh, however, you could ask if I have a non-trivial group, is there a representation that will give me a non-trivial invariant? And the answer to that is yes. Even a finite uh, image representation. So that's the part that you would say so yeah. says that it detects yeah. the unknot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so and that, and, and, and finding the small such representations is hard. And it's still, it's still hard. Yeah. So there's a, that question, does a faithful representation always give you non-trivial one invariant? Um, in this example, we have a two-component link. Unfortunately, the colors don't show up very, very well. Okay. But um, you, you, now, now you, you, uh, the abelianization of the, of the non-group is e plus e. So instead of t, we're going to have t1 and t2. Our abelianization map, which we call epsilon, now does double duty. So remember, before, epsilon went, went to z. Now it's going to z squared because it's a link. And we'll think of this as t1, t2, uh, commuting. Right. So now we'll just, we'll just do the same thing we did before. We look at the crossings. This is x2 plus t2 being carried over. This is the untwisted case. t2, x0. And t2 coming from from x2, because x2 is on the second component, is equal to x1 plus t1 times x2. Why t1? Because x1 was an arc on the first component. It's the only change, is the subscripts now show up in the untwisted case. Right? And then you write down the matrix and you find the determinant. Now, you, you, you divide for links. You divide, in the Alexander polynomial case, we just had this for the Alexander polynomial. But here we divide by, by, by the, by T1 minus 1, which is, yeah. If you want to get some of these, the Alexander Conway polynomial for a link, do you just set all the t's equal to one another, or is it more complicated? For two component links, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think for three component links, you've got to be uh, careful about how much you divide by. Okay. I think that's right. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. For two component links, it's, yeah. it's true. And you divide by t1 minus 1 because you've distinguished yes. part x naught was only one. You can think of 1 minus t1 is equally good, and that's the characteristic polynomial of the, of the 1 by 1 matrix 1. <laughs> the trivial representation will give you back the classical Alexander polynomial. OK, so uh, what you get here is, uh, is this polynomial, t1 minus 1, t2 minus 1. And it's nice to write the coefficients. This is t1, t2. 
uh, minus T1 minus T2 plus 1. To write the coefficients in this uh, matrix form, that's the coefficient of the constant term. That's the coefficient of T1, which is 1 comma 0. That's the coefficient of T2, which is 0 comma 1. And that's the coefficient of T1, T2, which is, think of as the position 1, 1. So write your, write your coefficients of your two variable polynomial and matrix form. And uh, this, is, this, for example, is done in Rawls. This is a nice way to visualize the coefficients. Um, but now if we, if we twist, this is a two bridge link. This is a, surprise. But this is a two bridge link. And um, as Susan mentioned, the, the group has the form meridian, a word W equals W, that meridian. And the, the word is sometimes very long. That's, that's the word. The bars over the letters mean inverse. And um, you can find a parabolic representation by sending x0 to 1101 and x2 to 10w1 and solving to see what you need to make this word happy. That is to get this equal to that. And you find out you have a polynomial condition. W has got to be a solution of w squared minus w minus 2. Uh, this is not a 1 now. For not, Susan mentioned you always get 1. This is a 2. And um, it's interesting that the, that the uh, geometric linking number here is 2. The algebraic linking number is zero, of course. Uh, in other examples, it, it, we seem to also be seeing geometric linking number two showing up here in the Riley polynomial of a two-bridge link. But sometimes we're seeing the algebraic one showing up, and it's not the geometric one. In other words, the situation seems to be in need of <laughs> some exploration. So here's a question. Find the, find the Riley polynomial of, a two, of two bridge links and try to understand what this constant coefficient means. Have you done su a sufficient number of examples and you either see geometric or algebraic and you don't see an example where it's neither? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 thought, mean, I thought the ones that you were showing me, if the algebraic linking number was non-zero, that that was a constant uh, coefficient. See, we, we've done about you know, eight or nine examples. <laughs> okay. Yes. And, and for, oh, for the, to, well, infinitely many if you count the torus. Links. And they're all beautiful. They all are very nice. So, so, so anyway, so here's, a, here's an interesting idea. Instead of taking a complex number here for the representation, let's take the uh, companion matrix of that complex number. C is the companion matrix 0, 2, 1, 1. Is the companion matrix of, of this uh, polynomial. And let's replace 1 by the 2 by 2 identity matrix. So here, so wherever you see a 0, that's a 2 by 2 0 matrix. We're essentially embedding the, uh, the uh, uh, Z adjoint uh, W in, in, into um, 2 by 2 matrices, this one. And so now we have 4 by 4 matrices, but they're integer coefficients. Integer coefficients. We've called this the total breadth of the parabolic representation. Uh, in, in a sense, you could, you could get at this thing by doing, taking all the roots one by one and multiplying the results together. But it's, but it's more fun to do this one. So, um, when you do that, here's the, here's the twisted matrix you get from this link, regardless of what representation you use, regardless of what you use. But if we use this representation, then the result we get is, is, is quite interesting. Um, this is the coefficient matrix for this polynomial. You can see the, the polynomials, it's quite big. And you see interesting patterns. The top row, for example, is the coefficients of, of t1 squared plus t1 minus 1 quantity squared, which is also the characteristic polynomial of x0. We haven't seen that always happening. I, and I, I, don't, I don't, don't know when it happens and what it is. There are some, some other, other neat patterns here. Um, I, think, I think you'll find yeah. Okay. Here's another. Here's the same picture, but it's a, it's a little clearer. Um, this column here is x is um, is the polynomial, uh, basically the coefficients of the polynomial x minus one to the fourth. In the untwisted case. 
the untwisted case, if you let T1 uh, be zero or T2 be zero, you get zero, which is a reflection of the fact that this is, these two components have zero linking. This is a consequence of, of, of uh, something called the Torres conditions, or twisted outside of the angles. Um, where is the uh, linking number lurking here? It's lurking in all. I don't think I don't think that the twisted Alexander polynomials of two bridge links has been explored at all, and, and using the uh, these parabolic representations and this idea of, of replacing the root of the Riley polynomial with the with the integer companion matrix gives you a whole bunch of, of nice integers to play around with and all kinds of things to discover. And um, uh, tomorrow, I think I'll, I'll start quickly with the example I didn't get to is the, the last thing I want to do, which is to talk about Bob Riley's quote, favorite knot. He referred to this as his favorite knot. It's a, it's a, it's a knot that has the same cipher form. Uh, in fact, it shares a cipher matrix with a, with a square knot. And um, it's got a lot of interesting properties. And um, I'll show you how you can use uh, twisted invariants to distinguish it from a square knot. And then talk to you talk to you about how Wada's uh, approach goes and why these are really group invariants. And therefore, if we can find a simple presentation for the group, we can get a simple computation of the variance. And um, I guess I'll stop here. Friday, probably instead of doing randomized intuition, we'll do more examples from the uh, two intuition ops. They motivate lots of lots of nice questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. So a lot of times, whenever you uh, are doing the Alexander polynomial, there's three formulations where you use t to the one half instead of t, right? And then when you happen to multiply everything out, you end up with integral powers. Right. This, if you, if you try and tag a representation on that, are things going to break down? So let me understand, what would you do? Um, All right, so, so instead of having a, with a link? an Alexander, no, not a link, I mean, just a knot. Instead of having an Alexander matrix that has only powers of t and x's in it, sometimes you would have powers of t to the 1 half. And it just so happens that when you take the determinant, I see. all the powers end up being integral. Right? I not tried it. OK. I guess the question is, Could you can you take the, scheme can, you, can you not flatten the, uh, the matrix, and when you're taking determinants, just multiply the, the blocks together. Is the that blocks that, don't commute? Whether yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. The blocks don't commute, and um, you know whether you yeah, you get a variant. Okay. Did something formal with them. That makes sense. Um, you said that really Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's fudging. Um, give, give me a second. Uh, if it's a condition, oh, I don't think so. Um, well, for any 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 parabolic representation of the torus knot, we'll, we'll give, uh, uh, regardless of whether it's two bridge or not, we'll give um, uh, a twisted polynomial that has roots on the unit circle. Um, any finite image representation, any finite uh, image representation will actually give a product of cyclotomies. And, and the proof of that is, is um, really relies on, on Wada's way of looking at things, not on the, not on the diagrams. I mean, these diagrams are great for getting computations, but if you want to prove things, they hide a lot of things, hide a lot of information. There's a lot of structure in the knot that comes from looking at the group in different ways. And uh, for example, the, the, the uh, torus knots are fiber knots. And so they have this, uh, the, the group is basically a free group with a z-action. And torus knots are special because the z-action is periodic. It's that periodicity that's called a cyclotomic factor. Which, uh, just trace it through the, the theory here. You can see one. Yeah. Speaking of the cyclotomic polynomials, it was, first of all, it was seem, seeming that in all your examples of the Wada invariant, invariant was a polynomial, 
and you didn't get the rational. So, I mean, were you just choosing nice examples? Or well, um, in the parabolic situations, you're, you're always going to you're always going to get uh, polynomials. Um, none of you in parabolic representations. Um, so, yeah, the, the only the only condition I know that will guarantee a polynomial is that condition I mentioned. That, that some element of the commutator subgroup goes to a matrix that doesn't have eigenvalue one. And this was a, this was proved by Katana. Uh, but it's can't be a necessary condition. I don't, I don't know. I don't know how to how to get a necessary condition. And then also we saw in some representations you had the Alexander polynomial appearing. And then there were cyclotomic kind of pluses and minuses scattered throughout. And then in one of them you had sort of one big mass and another one had another big mass. <laughs> Good term for it. And do, you, do you end up with just one of those problem factors, or um, I mean, uh, well, is the there any kind of structure? Well, the problem, I mean, the problem factors are the things that are of interest. Right? They're, the, they're the things that, that suggest something. Right. Did I, did I understand that there's other factors for cyclotomic that can be just fine? No, not necessarily. No. Okay, so then you had said something early. I mean, was there any conditions that you have for a finite Do Any conditions what? On the Y of the variant, if the image is fine. On what will show up? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay. No, no. So like Wide open stuff. Yeah. yeah. What about, okay, when you're saying parabolic, are you talking about higher, I mean, just dimension two parabolics? Or well, uh, yeah, I'm talking about SL2C, trace two so matrices. If, if you looked at sort of parabolics and higher, you know, higher SLMs, or right? Other right. Don't don't know. Um, basically, we're looking for ways to get to get integer polynomials out of this because from from the approach that Susan and I like to use on on knots, if you could have um, uh, well, if you have an integer polynomial, then you could you could look at things like the model measure of it. And you could ask what do the roots, what do the roots tell you about the uh, about this uh, knot. And in this case, the in the, in the twisted case, the roots are at the model measure, the roots are actually telling you about the growth of twisted homology of of uh, of, the, of various uh, finite sheet covers. Uh, and uh, um, so that was our interest in that. Was this. And, and, but, but I just think it's neat that you can, you can have all these combinatorial questions now about the numbers here. And, uh, and you start looking at these rows and columns and just factoring them and, and you start to see patterns that, that really need to be explained. It must be, it must be perhaps there are twisted torus conditions that can, can express at least for two bridge knots, two bridge knots. Thank you.